Please open up your Bibles to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. If you're taking notes today, the title of this message is A Moment of Teaching. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 2, and we'll stop at verse 11. Early in the morning, Jesus came to the temple. Crowds of people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who'd been caught in the act of adultery. Placing her in the midst of everyone, they said this to Jesus. Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. According to the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And as they continued to press him, he stood up and said to him, Let him who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard what he said, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She says, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its power. And thank you for this great gift. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that he would speak to us today. I pray that he would guide us into truth, into life. I pray that your presence be here with us today so that we can hear what you have to say. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for saving us. And thank you that we now live a new life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. In this passage, Jesus is in his third year of ministry. It's, it's widely known that his ministry was three years long. The first year is known as the year of preparation. The second year, the year of popularity. And the third year, the year of opposition. At this point, he, Jesus has been baptized. He's had the Holy Spirit descend on him from heaven like a dove. The audible voice of God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Water has been turned into wine, John chapter 2. The phrase born again in John chapter 3 is out there and people are wrestling with that and trying to figure out what Jesus meant when he said you have to be born again. All the apostles have been chosen at this point and Jesus has done a great deal of good in and beyond his community. He's led thousands of people to faith. One of those being the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. Jesus has healed many people. He has set people free from demonic influence. He's made blind people see, paralyzed people walk, dead people alive. 
He fed 5,000 hungry people with just a few loaves of bread and a few little sardine-like fish. And after many life-giving sermons, after much teaching and exhortation, he has brought light into the world. He's done a great deal of good for humanity at this point. By this time, he's one of the most popular men on the planet. Mass crowds of people, they can't help themselves. They're just coming to him, they're following him, and they're being positively influenced by everything he has to say and everything that he is doing. But that's just one perspective. There's another perspective out there. And from this perspective, Jesus has caused a great deal of controversy. He's driven out money-grubbing salespeople from the temple. He's flipped over their tables. He's snapped a whip at them. He's publicly called out religious leaders for their self-righteousness and hypocrisy. He has questioned their doctrine. And he has disrupted their religious culture. By John chapter 5, Jesus is criticized for healing a man on the Sabbath. By John chapter 6, he's telling people that he is the literal bread of life. And he's saying things like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you, but only death. It's a pretty bold, controversial statement, and it stirs quite the commotion. So now he's facing persecution from some pretty high up men in Jewish circles. People are literally trying to kill him. By this time, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, is dead. He got his head cut off for the sake of the gospel. Now add to that the fact that Jesus' own family thinks that he is crazy. They think that he is, the scripture says, out of his mind. And by John chapter 7, people are saying that Jesus himself has a demon. And that explains his behavior and his bold statements and his signs and miracles. So with all this good, with all this light that Jesus is bringing into the world, there's also this dark cloud of resentment and evil, and it's sort of making its way in for this inevitable collision. There's a lot of tension and chaos brewing up into this moment. There's a vibe out there that's like, Jesus is awesome. He's the man. And then there's the other vibe that's like, Jesus is going down. We're going to get this guy. On one hand, he's become an inspiration to many, but at the exact same time, he's becoming a prime target for the haters. He has mass crowds of followers and disciples, and then he's got this anti-Jesus movement that's working against him. I want to pause right there and just pull back for a second because this, this, this passage obviously reveals two categories of people, those that are for Jesus and those who are against him. But when I think about this passage, um, I, I, I can't help but think of a third category of people. And somewhere in the neutral zone, I see this opinionated activist just on the sidelines, sort of this agnostic sideliner, and this is what this is what he's thinking. Okay, Jesus is a pretty good humanitarian. It's obvious that they want to kill him. You know, that kind of stinks for him, but he'd probably not be in so much trouble if he wasn't so biased. Maybe if he was a little more politically correct, they might cut him a break. 
maybe if he was a little more tolerant, they might leave him alone. But he also needs to show more concern about the issues that currently stand, the issues that are actually affecting us. Things like racism, prejudice, oppression, poverty, corruption, crime, disease, divisiveness. There's a polarization of society that needs to be dealt with. And in fact, if Jesus is the son of God, can't he just snap his fingers and rid the world of all its hate and problems? If Jesus is really a Messiah, why should society continue to suffer? If he really cared about world peace, he'd lift up his hands and he'd say, Father, fix all this. Well, that's not what's happening. Here's what's happening. What's happening is that Jesus is waking up early at the crack of dawn. He's walking down to the temple. He's letting the people gather around him and he's sitting down and he's teaching them. And the opinionated activist sideliner is looking on and he's thinking, what the heck is Jesus doing? A real leader would start a boycott. A real leader would start a mass protest, not a Bible study. What good is a Bible study going to do? People don't want thoughts and prayers. They want action. They want a solution. There's no time to be still and wait on God. Well, it's a good thing that Jesus isn't sort of tunnel visioned by activism. It's a good thing that his focus is on heavenly things, not earthly things. But it's not that Jesus is minimizing the real world issues. It's simply that he knows the most impactful thing he can do for society right now is to wake up early in the morning, walk down to a place outside of his comfort zone, and teach people about God. You want to rid the world of its problems? You want to have a positive impact on society? Here's step one. Step one is teach people about God and show them the love of Jesus. If you want to see transformation on a global scale, teach people about God, inform them about his truths, and show them the love of Jesus. Every single day of Jesus' life was lived on mission for God. You know what the mission is? We are. We're the mission. Every single moment in Jesus' ministry was a fulfillment of promise, and the promise was made to us. One of my favorite passages uh, of Scripture is Jeremiah 31, 33. And this is what it says. This is the Lord talking. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their hearts, that's where love comes from, and I will write it on their minds so that they can know me, so that they can pursue wisdom, so they can have the right perspective. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. This passage in John chapter 8, this is, a, this is about a moment of teaching. And this passage reflects the beauty of God's sovereignty in the midst of all this chaos. Everybody, close your eyes just, just for a minute. I want you to see Jesus sitting there. 
I want you to see his people gathered around him, ready to listen, ready to learn. Forget about the past. Forget about the cares of this world. This is God saying, hey, let's talk about you and me. You see it? This is God saying, hey, I'm going to make you a promise. Let me teach you how to love. Let me show you how to live. Let's be a family and let's live in community. And let's stay together forever and ever and ever. You can open your eyes now. I want you to know that we have special insight into this passage. So that when we read, early in the morning, Jesus came down to the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. I want you to see a moment of promise, a moment of teaching. And I want you to see Emmanuel, God is with us. I want you to see the word become flesh. I want you to see the fellowship and the community and the care. I want you to see his love and his mercy and his grace. I want you to see the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I want you to see the way and the truth and the life because not everybody can see this. Not everybody can see the beauty in the midst of chaos. And not everybody can see that God is constantly, constantly taking action to mend the brokenness of this world. And it's tragic. It's tragic that every non-believer walking by the temple and seeing Jesus sitting there teaching is thinking, That's just another spiritual therapy session. And that's just another building that they go to and gather and sing some songs and pray so that they can deal with their feelings and emotions. It gives them purpose. It gives them a reason to keep going. It's a crutch. It's sad that Some atheists today will look at the church and what they see is an old-fashioned, outdated, prehistoric, primitive way of life. And to them, Christianity is just a phony fairy tale to help us deal with the stress of life. They think it's all fake. They think it's the greatest scam of all time, while we think it's the greatest story ever told. And so some of them seek to expose Jesus as a crazy person, just out to scare people into a life of submission. It's just a big power play to them. I have a friend on Facebook, and one day this friend posted a meme and it's a, uh, it's a picture of Jesus. And we, I think we've all seen it before. He's sitting down, and there's about five or six children around him. It looks like it's about on the outskirts of a village or something. Very peaceful picture, very pleasant atmosphere. He's got his hand out, reaching for one of them. I think he might be praying or teaching or just loving on them, right? And this picture is memed. And it says, love me or I'll torture you forever. Do what I say or burn in hell. This is what the gospel sounds like to people who are lost. That is what the gospel sounds like to people who haven't quite received the right perspective. And so they think things like, Jesus has no right to make such outrageous claims. He's got no right to tell me how to live. 
He's got to be stopped. He's got to be silenced. We have to make this guy go away. And that's along the same lines as to how these scribes and Pharisees are thinking in verses 3 through 6. It says that they caught a woman in adultery. They brought her to Jesus and said, Teacher, this woman was sleeping with somebody that she's not supposed to be sleeping with. The law says we got a stoner. What are you going to do about it? So in the law, yes, there were commandments that forbade adultery and sexual immorality and sexual perversion, and the majority of it was punishable by death. If you, if you look at Leviticus and you look at Deuteronomy, you'll, you'll read. It's, it's clear as day. Um, if a man cheats on his wife with another woman, that man and that woman are taken to the city gates and they're stoned to death. That's the punishment that they receive. And, and the reason for the law, Scripture actually says this, is so that we can purge the evil out of the camp of Israel. So in modern day terms, it's, hey, if a guy cheats on his wife with another woman, there has to be some church discipline there. And if we have to, we have to remove them from the church because there is no place for that type of behavior in the church of God, in the midst of God's people. Premarital sex, incest, rape, homosexuality, in the Old Testament, all punishable by death. And again, the idea is to purge the evil out of Israel. God is holy. God is righteous. That was his commandment, and he had every right to do so. Now, remember, we have special insight into this passage. We can see what's really going on here. In fact, John tells us in verse 6, this was a trick so that they could bring Jesus up on criminal charges. This wasn't about purging the evil from Israel. This wasn't about cleanliness. This wasn't about upholding the law. This was about protecting their religious culture. This was about protecting their way of life at all costs, even if it meant carrying out a hit on Jesus. When we make a commitment to ministry, there's going to be opposition. And we know this because we were once opposed. There's going to be people with the wrong perspective. And they will fight to continue in their way of life at all costs. They will go to extremes. They'll attack the Bible. They'll badmouth Jesus. They'll badmouth the churches. They'll look at our scandals and, they, and they'll think, what a bunch of hypocrites, right? They'll do anything to discredit and shame all of it. Christianity, Jesus, the Bible, all of it. And their goal most of the time is for us to just give up, unfollow Jesus, and so that we'll stop inviting them to church and stop praying for them, right? Jesus actually said this in John chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, know that it hated me first. I don't think it's any secret that there are people out there who hate the church. Persecution was rampant throughout all biblical history, and, and it continues to this very day. In every generation, there have been people opposed to God and opposed to God's people. And this opposition, it comes in all forms. Hate speech, hate crimes, anti-Christian literature, anti-Christian media. And some of these are so persuasive that a lot of Christians are being succumbed to it. A lot of believers are being tricked into doing things that goes against what they believe. It's a tough time to be a Christian in today's society. 
a lot of us are experiencing or being tempted with a crisis of faith. And we have to make a decision. We have to decide if we're going to keep going. We have to decide if we're going to persevere. We have to be ready with the right perspective. Jesus was always ready with the right perspective. He was always ready to respond lovingly, graciously, but nonetheless, firmly. And here's his response to the schemes and the tricks. Look, look, look at the end of verse 7. It says, Jesus stood up and said to them, let the guy who is without sin among you be the first one to throw a stone. Now, a couple of things to acknowledge real quick. This woman, she's guilty. And she deserves to be punished. It's the law. Jesus knew that. Jesus wrote the law. He memorized it. But remember, this, this, this is a moment of teaching. This is a moment of promise. And it's a moment that John actually alludes to in chapter 1, verse 14 through 17, which says, The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I so love this part. This is where, this is where it gets real for all of us. Because even though this woman is obviously struggling with purity, She's, she's unclean, she's dirty, but Jesus' first priority for this woman is to protect her from any harm. Even though she made a mistake, even though she messed up, even though she got caught, even though she did something she wasn't supposed to do, Jesus' first priority is protection for her from any harm. So now he peacefully, non-violently, gets these tricksters off of her back. And one by one in verse 9, starting with the older ones, they realize that the trick is now on them. Because as soon as Jesus says, let him who is without sin, they remember there is nobody without sin. They remember that everyone has fallen short, everyone has missed the mark, Everyone is deserving of judgment, the judgment that this woman is under in this moment. And these haters with the wrong perspective, they realize, they realize that Jesus has outwitted them with the right perspective. And so Jesus is left standing there, protecting her. And what this is, is, a, is, it's a beautiful picture of Jesus as her shield, her fortress, her high tower and deliverer. That's language from Psalm 18, verse 2. Ladies, as daughters of God, as precious sisters, Jesus' first priority is protecting you from harm physically and spiritually. And the reason why is because his protection positions you for grace and truth. It positions you for love and forgiveness. It positions you to be teachable so that God can lovingly take his law and put it in your mind and write it on your heart. Guys, one of our highest priorities as men is to do a better job at protecting our women from harm. God has blessed us with so many strong and amazing godly women. And, and we need to do a better job at guarding their hearts and caring for them. There's too many guys out there who don't have a clue how to treat women. And as a result, they're, they're, they're being objectified, they're being dominated, they're being put down. And that, that, that's not, that's not Christ-like. That's not what Jesus did. If you want to know how to treat your mom or your sister or your aunt or your grandma, study Jesus' interactions with women. 
Because in the entire history of masculinity, there is no greater man, no greater son, no greater brother, no greater bridegroom, no greater friend than Jesus. And you see, that's the reason why he wakes up early at the crack of dawn. He walks down to the temple and all the women and all the men and all the children, they just flock to him. They gather around him because they're drawn to him and they want to spend all their time and all their energy doing what he says and listening to what he says. And he positions them for protection. He positions them to be healed. He positions them to receive grace and truth. He positions them out of darkness and into the light. He positions them for once I was blind, but now I see. And why? Why does he do this? It's so that he can sit down and teach them, be with them, fellowship with them, love them, This morning, we have all been positioned for teaching. We have all been positioned to know the difference between the right perspective and the wrong perspective. Not by me, but by Jesus. He's the one that led you to your church. He's the one that gave you your pastors and your small groups and your community. So here's our moment of teaching. Look at verse 10. Jesus stands up and says to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. I want to talk real quick just about what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, let's get you some therapy. Let's get you in a program. Therapy is not the answer here. He doesn't say, go, and from now on, try your best not to make any more mistakes. He doesn't say, go and be all you can be and try to live your best life now. He doesn't say to stay either. He knows that she needs some solitude for her soul, some time to be alone with God so she, she can heal and there can be a, a, a redemption there. So he says, go and from now on, sin no more. Sinning no more is the proper response for someone who's been forgiven of every wrongdoing that they have ever done, every wrongdoing that they are currently doing, and every wrongdoing that they will do in the future. That is the price of our freedom. We owe a significant debt to God, and we pay it back by leaving everything behind, including our sin, so that we can follow Jesus. I know that everybody in here is smart enough to know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Life is just, it's, it's more than the pursuit of happiness. It's more than money. It's more than retirement. It's more than vacations. It exceeds far beyond the American dream. It's about going and sinning no more. It's about denying ourselves, picking up our cross daily to follow Jesus. It's about loving him with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength and all your soul. And then loving your neighbor like you would love yourself. It's about being done with hatred and heartlessness. It's about 
no longer being opposed. It's about being done with the tricks and the schemes. It's about leaving behind the sexual sin and the blatant disregard for God's word. It's also about realizing that we are utterly and completely dependent upon God for everything. Grace, mercy, love, forgiveness. And we take all that and we extend it to the rest of the world. We take all that and we love and we forgive I want to encourage you real quick with these final thoughts. This is a passage that's a reminder to all of us that we've been, number one, positioned for teaching. Number two, protected from harm. And number three, persuaded to follow Jesus. In order to have the right perspective, we have to remain teachable. We have to remain humble. We have to remain servants. We have all been rescued from a broken lifestyle. And we have the power in our, in our testimony, within our testimony, to, to affect and positively impact other people. So share your story and share it often. Use your faith to run after God And challenge others to do the same. And the purpose of it all? It's so that he will be our God, we will be his people, and he will remember our sins no more.